Um, <clears throat> great. A again, really appreciate everyone joining today's session on the future of underwriting. Um, we're we're going to kick things off. I know there's probably going to be a few people who join uh, join later, but but that's great. They can catch up. Um, so one, thank you very, very, very much for joining and taking the time. Um, we've got an exciting topic here. We've got interesting insights from both Google and Deloitte. I think everyone's going to really enjoy it. We also really hope it's interactive as, as well. So at the end, we've got time set aside for a Q&A. Please, at any point, submit questions via the Q&A feature. Um, we'll answer them, though, at the end. We're, we're also happy to have follow-up conversations. So, so please reach out to, to myself or, or anyone else um, part of the panel, and, uh, and we can have, uh, have deeper conversations on specific topics that are, that are relevant to you. So as, as introductions, I'm Mark Patterson. I'm a partner here in the UK, focused on the insurance practice. I'm joined today by uh, John Abel, who's coming to us from Google. Uh, John focuses on working with insurance companies to apply Google's immense technology capabilities as well as their AI, machine learning, and data to solve really, really tough insurance problems. And he's got great examples he's going to share with us today on where he's done that um, in the industry and really innovative ways to tackle problems. In addition to John, Sue Labs Orals here, who's a director in our AI practice. Um, Sulab lives and breathes AI, and he's really into not just the theory of AI, but how do you make that real? And so in insurance and in other industries, he's working with, with people to go and solve these problems using very, very different techniques with AI. And of course, when you're talking about underwriting, AI and data go hand in hand. So I thought they would be the perfect panelists here to, to join us today. Um, lastly, before I get into get into the actual content here, um, we are recording this session. Uh, it's going to be made available to everyone um, after the session. We'll probably get it out early next week. So uh, if you have to drop early, completely understand and uh, look out for that email from us if you want to uh, see what you missed if you had to drop off. So, so with that, I'm, I'm going to jump into this, um, jump into the, the topics here um, to set some context for what we're gonna talk about today and how Deloitte and Google view the future of insurance. We very much believe that in the future, insurers are gonna compete on their ability to find, consume, process, and respond to data. That that's gonna be at the heart of everything that's done. And the winners and losers are gonna be differentiated based on their ability to do that better than their competitors. And so when we're talking about underwriting, right? Underwriting is gonna be fundamentally changed because they're gonna have the technology and data that allows them to, what we're referring to is regain control of their craft, right? In the future, and we're gonna go deeper on this, they've got the digital tools, the ability to access their own data and their own proprietary models in there to, under, to assess risk and make underwriting decisions. In the current day, highly dependent on what's the data the brokers are gonna give us. What's the data I can get from the customers? What kind of black box algorithms have the actuaries handed me that I need to try to figure out? Versus in the future, it's about them having control of that experience. It's gonna be their data or the data sources they choose from to, to feed into, their, into that. As we go through today's uh, conversations, it, it is some, some concepts are gonna be a little bit more commercial lines and specialty market focus, but we also believe that most of them apply on the retail side too. So, so we'll try to draw the connection between both of those as we go through our dialogue. So where do we wanna focus on today? And what are the kind of key topics that we, that we wanna hit on? The, there is you know, a bottomless pit, if you will, of underwriting related topics that we could go after here but we only have about an hour. And so what we think on is three key areas that in the future underwriters could fundamentally change how they do their job and how the business operates. So the first one that we're gonna hit on is probably the most talked about one, but I think we have some different insights on making it real, which is leveraging that hidden, relevant and timely insights to make those underwriting and pricing decisions. And that's gonna be a critical part as we move forward in leveraging that vast number of data. The next piece we wanna move on to is how do you actually quantify and exploit your understanding of the market sentiment and competitive data? So beyond the underwriting and the pricing decision, how do you get into and guide underwriters in the future to guide them through that negotiation with the broker? Or how do you know the best way to present that price or the right product to present to your end customer? 
The last piece is, can you fundamentally revisit how you look at your underwriting strategy and your portfolio? Can you dynamically adjust your underwriting and portfolio strategy now that you have all this data coming in and you've got this empowered underwriters? How can you fundamentally change that from what is traditionally a yearly process to be kind of an agile, ongoing, near real-time uh, process? Of course, th these topics are based on the foundation of having you know, strong digital platforms, of having people that have the right adaptability skills and know how to leverage data, product set that's flexible and adaptable against that, and of course, still having that strong pricing capability. So we're gonna focus on those top three items that we, we hit on, but definitely acknowledge that to be successful in those, you obviously need a fundamental of, uh, fundamental underlying good platform people and processes in there. And happy to hit on any of that in the Q&A if there's some specific spots that people wanna go deeper on. Okay, so let's jump into this, right? So, so first topic that we wanna hit on uh, today is around leveraging, up the, leveraging the hidden data, right? So I think that this is the most talked about one, but I also think it's the one where I would challenge that insurers are still struggling with making real. We all know that there is a mass amount of structured, unstructured, internal, external data, new data sources from different, different uh, places, the challenge isn't just amassing, you know, millions of data points. The challenge that we view and what we believe that you need to be able to do properly is to suck that data in and quickly identify what are those, you know, critical insights that we need to surface up to the underwriters, right? So it's not about showing the underwriter 100 new data points. It's about saying, here's three insights that are specific to that risk at that, this time and to the decision you're trying to make. And hopefully, these are insights that we would challenge that your, com your competitors have or not. This is obviously going to allow you to do uniquely underwrite that risk as far as applying that insight in the actual decision making in there. You're going to be able to massively change your operational throughput there by being able to accelerate putting things in through there. And this is part of the fundamental change in there. So, so Sula, this is where I'm going to bring you into the conversation. And then, John, I'd love it if you added in then on how you're doing this from a Google perspective. But, but Sula, can you talk a bit about a bit about this from an AI and data lens on, on how you're approaching it? Let me just get off mute. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, I was on uh, on mute before that. Um, so, so it's sort of it's a very pertinent question. So. The way the way we are approaching um, um, it from an AI um, and and uh, and like a new data source perspective, as you know, you, we got to think about how this data is being actually captured. So when I think about data, I think about four different things. Um, uh, there is today you have all of this data because there are technologies to capture it well, to extract data from uh, previously unextractable places or uh, where it, the costs were high. There is technology that generates data and there is technology that then helps us sense this data. So those are the four key things. And I want to bring this, uh, bring this uh, to uh, uh, this point to uh, this discussion is that we'll very quickly see, I'll share some examples, but we we'll very quickly see why actually thinking through the relevancy of information and what kind of technology one needs uh, to, 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 to get data together becomes really important for the business case of data, which is really important for underwriting. So like, you know, like I said, the first bit is like devices of capture. You have many more new devices of capture uh, for, for, for data. And um, this is basically, uh, this is, this is, these devices of capture have existed, uh, but they have now scaled uh, across multiple different industries. And when I talk about devices of capture, I mean anything from satellites to wearables, right? So satellites, IoT sensors, airplanes uh, collecting, uh, uh, using LiDAR, um, geospatial locational data, the new generation mapping softwares. Um, on the other side, on personal side, uh, as well as on commercial side, you have IoT, you have new sensors. Um, so... So, so you basically, there are different, different types of technologies that have, uh, that have come together 
to, to generate these kind of uh, these kind of information um, sources. The important thing is how do you utilize them? That's that's point number that's point number one. I'll also talk about how new technologies are generating information and give some examples from the cybersecurity industry, which will have implication to cyber insurance. So let's let's jump into some examples. Um, for example, uh, like you know, if you think about lidar, um, and and in my experience, and I've been doing it uh, myself. Um, in property insurance today, LIDAR is being used for architectural um, assessment. So not only can you now use, start using LIDAR to, to look at height of buildings um, uh, for underwriting, but you can also actually start looking at mul multiple different architecture features, uh, secondary modifiers, um, such as whether it has setbacks, whether, whether it has um, overhangs, those kind of things. However, the important thing, and that's where re relevancy starts coming in, is you cannot use LIDAR on its own because it has a drift. So if you want to basically locate a property and automate collection of some variables on that property for commercial underwriting, you need to be able to use mapping software along with LIDAR so that, so that you get the right property. So that's, that's, that's one example. Then there, are, then there are multi more examples just within property. And, and another, another example is um, um, age of property. Now we know in the UK, um, and uh, it varies by it varies by different countries. But we know in the UK, you have um, lots of uh, um, um, age data, but it's it's sometimes held by councils, sometimes it's ha held by survey companies. There's actually not one single source that can give the age of the property um, uh, together. And uh, then on top of that, there are big big gaps, and that's that's a problem um, um, globally. And so what we're basically seeing there is the emergence of that yes, there is data, but there is emergence of the use of um, um, oblique imagery, street level imagery, along with machine learning, to actually assess the age of properties and fill these gaps. And with these two examples, what I'm what, what I'm what I'm what I'm bringing to uh, to to bear here really is that today the way we look at data has changed because there are technologies of new technologies of capture as well as technologies for extraction such as AI, which make different data possible. But then we come to another, another element, which is um, it's not only data that's being captured by different devices. Actually, new technologies such as AI can generate information. Um, a classic example is cyber, in, uh, cyber security, not yet insurance, but cyber security. Um, AI is being used to generate or mimic hackers to see how strong uh, cyber uh, cyber systems are um, um, at companies. This will in eventually have impact on insurance. And you can see the use of machine learning and AI to generate information that can help insurers access what the cyber security profile of a client is before they underwrite. So that th those are those are different uh, uh, different uh, uh, examples of how the whole spectrum of technology is shaping uh, uh, different data sources. And um, there are a couple of things that I would just like to uh, I add before I before I pass it on to John from 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 his tremendous experience from the Google Google perspective, is that um, as all of these technologies come, you can classically start seeing that you know you will have a lot of data, and what is more important is the relevance, and it's because relevance is important not only because of the volume of data but because data at best is patchy. There is actually not one single source that primary source for any of these data points that I've, I've mentioned, but whether it's in marine, whether it's in property, whether it's in motor insurance, there's no one single uh, primary source of, of, of information. And so what basically this is about is how do you use technology to bring all of this data together, to stitch it to, together, and to be able to extract insights in a timely manner with uh, the capability to put it in production. There is no point of having uh, uh, really good data if those insights, once you find those hidden trends, cannot be used in business as usual. In fact, almost 78% um, financial services companies are never able to put hidden insights into production for competitive advantage. That's, that is the scale of the challenge. So it's about technology, it's about capture, it's about finding the right in insights, bringing it together and putting it into production. Um, so and, um, and 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 like at this point, like you know, it would be it would be great if if John, um, you give your perspective on how you see Google shaping uh, this pipeline. 
Uh, thank you and uh, good morning and good afternoon or good evening depending on where you are in the world at this time watching this either live or repeated. Um, I think actually the key thing about this is I always look at it as three types of data. There is first of all the data you own, the private data that gives you your unique insight. Um, this one was the classic one that we used to apply in a lot of, and, and Brian, you ask a, a great example, and I'll give you some examples now. Um, you want some real life examples. We, we would cl classically use this because we feel this is the most powerful. What we're now knowing is there's publicly available data. Uh, in the industry, it's called PSI, public sector information. Um, there's imaging data, and there's also generated data. If you look at the companies that will be the most successful going forward, they were the companies that take all these types of different data sets and then blend it to understand a lens of what they're looking at. So in insurance, we talk about assets or we talk about the underwriting part. I'm not a world authority on insurance. Um, I've been involved in it for a small amount of period. What I do know though, is the first thing is we have to extract more value from what we already capture. So example would be, uh, we use document AI. A lot of the uh, corporate insurance actually today has uh, uh, basically scanned images or they process documents. We can now extract larger volumes of data from those same documents electronically. This gives, first of all, the underwrite more visibility to the risk and also gives the ability for someone to look at it in a digital structure. This is happening now. The other one I'd like to talk about is a, a real life reference case, uh, moneysupermarket.com. One of the things I like about this is they, they realize that we can get very easily overweighed by the amount of technology that we need. We as technologists love talking uh, in quotes, the geek of the technology, but actually what we're trying to do here is simplify it now. So they're a great example of how they've taken the data closer to the end user. So it's super important when we look at the data that we look at it across multiple lenses. We start actually releasing some of the focus that we'd have on the deep technology and let companies like Google deal with that for you. And then the third point is the biggest value to organization will be how you use it across the horizontal of the business. And uh, for me, this is another great example. Uh, one of the announcements recently, and I know some of my dear friends from Brit are on this call, is the key announcement where they're creating a platform. And this is a key element that what you will see is this industry has got great historical past and a great wisdom to what could be the future. But what we've got to do is release that in new ways of engagement with brokers, with the actuaries. So not only we have to capture the data, but we also have to have a new engagement style. And I know in a minute we're going to come back to this one. So, Mark, I'll pass it back to you so we can uh, move on. Thanks, John. That's that's great. And and, and just before we move on, it's too loud. I'm going to bug you once, bug you again, uh, if it's okay, on, um, on on an example. You you know. One of the things I think is critical that John and, and Sulab's hitting on here is it's not just some single data source you need to tap into and great all your things are answered. It's about how do you apply insight? How do you combine multiple pieces of data? And Sulab was referencing earlier the age of, of buildings. Sulab, you and I were chatting about this before, uh, before today's webinar. And you were talking about how your team was even sort of doing research on architectural characteristics of buildings by age to then apply that insight to automatically extract it. it can, can you just maybe expand on that use case for everyone? I think other people would find it interesting as well. Yeah, sure. So, um, like I said, we were um, we were trying to build um, we were trying to build a database of age of properties, um, um, and we started out with the UK, uh, but wanted to expand it out globally. And one of the challenges we found was, like I said earlier. Um, the data on age of commercial properties is patchy at best. There are a couple of different sources to get age of property. So you've got companies that do surveys, they're quite expensive now, um, but, but the maximum coverage those companies can give which, who do surveys to capture the property age is about 20, 25% in any, any market, that's an average. Um, and so, and then there is, a, there is a lot of open data in some companies about pro uh, property ages too, but we could not get, we, most we could get from existing databases was 30%. Then we started talking to some universities um, and um, universities that are in civil that have a great a lot of research in civil and uh, engineering and architecture, and we basically stumbled upon a research uh, um, um, after speaking to some um, uh, some researchers that um, 
street level imagery and uh, oblique imagery, i.e. imagery taken from aircraft was being utilized. And when we did a bit of digging into it, uh, read those papers and understood uh, what they were trying to do, we came to a very quick conclusion in commercial property to think about the commercial properties in the last hundred years. In the UK, there have been six major, five or six major changes in build, building standards. There have been smaller changes every year, but six or seven major changes. And when a building regulation changes, what basically changes is, uh, is how builders build or construct commercial property. So there is a direct correlation between, you, you would see that the, uh, we found that when you use imagery and when you use geospatial data, there's a direct correlation build a, between building architecture and I'll talk about that in a minute, and the age of property uh, to a level of decades. You can't get a point estimate of that this building is 19, 1917, but you can get a pretty good estimate on, 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 on a decade. One example is, and I'll talk, I'll talk about retail properties. Pre -world, just in the UK, pre-World War II, uh, private uh, uh, personal, personal properties always had a kitchen basically separate from the house. When I say separate, it's basically a, it's jutting out of the main body of the house. So if you look, if you take an oblique imagery or satellite imagery, you know that that is a house that was designed uh, uh, pre World War II. Now that's one architectural feature. The other architectural features in commercial properties uh, that we found were to do with decos, decorative features, um, ornaments, um, uh, 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 roof level uh, uh, features. They all point to different standards uh, of architecture. And we were able to get a pretty, uh, a, a very high uh, rate, uh, uh, a predictive accuracy rate. And the point, the point on this. So thanks for asking this question, Mark. The point really, really is, it's not only about, it's not only about the data that's available. It's about how do you combine um, information from unseemingly related areas, such as imagery in this case, along with research that's going on because of new technology enables that kind of research, um, along with peripheral information and SME knowledge of architecture and, and, and researchers to all bring together to actually produce a variable. Um, so that's, that's, that's one example. Great. Um, th th thanks, Philip. I think that's, that's really, really helpful. And I, and I love those, some of those stories. And maybe we'll hit on a few more of them in the, the Q&A. So that's around, you know, how do we leverage that data for kind of the actual core underwriting risk selection type purpose? There's another piece now we want to bring in, and this is where we start talking about the actual market sentiment or the competitive positioning. The reality is underwriting, this is especially true in the commercial and specialty side of it, is not just about coming up with a price and underwriting decision and hoping for the best. It's also about how do you position your quotes or, or your, you know, come back on that submission in the market so that you can win that business. Underwriters who have been around for 30 years and know the market do this naturally. They have their finger on the pulse of what's going on in the market, right? They're taking what they overheard when, when they were down at the box or they're at the coffee shop. They know the different movements that are happening in the market, and therefore they know, hey, I'm going to present my quote when it comes in around this a little bit differently, or I'm going to present it later, earlier, or I'm going to change it to have this type of product in there. And so what we're talking about here is how do you take that incredible amount of expertise and that data that people are kind of taking in through those years of experience and chatter, they're hearing, chatter that they're hearing and make it actionable? Right, and actually present it back to the end. So what, what we talk about here is sucking up, if you will, we just talk about all the risk data, but how do you take in and do analysis on that broker and customer relationships, right? How do you take into account different types of market noise? Do you know when that quote comes in who the decision maker might be at the customer side beyond just the broker side? Can you pull together all of your history and interaction with both that broker and that customer, that individual producer in the broker's office? Have you taken into account your other informal interactions? Have you gone in mind and realized that, well, you know that that broker is really close with an underwriter at one of your competitors who's specific in that market, and just last week they posted on Instagram that they went fishing together, right? Sucking in all of those different types of, of pieces in there, looking at both the company <laughs> that you're going to do the underwriting for, as in the final end customer, as well as those competitors around, do you know what their strategy is? Do you know that this broker for this type of business probably took it to these three underwriting companies 
And I know that the two competitors have recently made a big investment leadership changes in this specific space. Therefore, they're likely to approach it in X way. Right? So there is a mass amount of this data in the market that I believe that we are underutilizing into the actual underwriting piece. So our belief is that what we need to do is bring that data in, similar to the way that, that Sulab just talked about, kind of the data for risk assessment. Apply that against both analytics to surface those insights, as well as potentially aligning on different negotiation theories in there to give and guide the underwriter. It's not going to automate what the underwriter is doing, but guide the underwriter of going, this is what we think you need to do to win this business. We know you've got the right price and the right underwriting decision from a technical perspective, but what do you need to go do to win it? And that's not just about, you know, what price do you give? That's when do you give that price? What products do you bundle in? How do you present it back? All of those types of things come into place. And we think that by surfacing that up, now you suddenly have an ability to predict the market behavior and be able to win more work and be able to leverage your workforce more because not all of your underwriters are gonna have 20, 30 years of experience in that specific area and naturally know how to apply all of this because this allows guiding them through that. Sulab, do you wanna talk about some of your experiences around this kind of competitive side of, of the, the game and how to make bring this to life? Yeah, sure, um, sure thanks, Mark. Um, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically my my experience. Uh, this is an emerging field, by the way. So, um, collecting data on uh, on competition and market movements um, has just started, and there are different propositions that uh, that, that 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 the industry is applying. Um, I'll bring some examples from the capital markets banking industry, if that is okay, uh, in this because uh, they have there is they're slightly ahead uh, in terms of applications. Um, and what's really happening um, uh, there is uh, with a view of how do you give tools to, um, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to traders, sales, uh, sales teams, um, and, and uh, originators um, that they can take effective decisions really quickly because a, 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 lo a lot of, about, a lot of this, this is about um, uh, the analytical market sentiments and uh, uh, competitive positioning is about um, as the industry has industries and 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 markets have grown, the front line uh, the front business has grown. Front line staff have actually become distant from their customers. They still meet their customers, but because they've got so many more clients, they've got so many different quotes to handle. Uh, they don't have that much time that they would have had, like, you know, let's say 30, 40 years ago to really personally understand the market as well as their customer. But they've, they've, they've basically become distant. So what basically is happening there is uh, the, use of, the use of market-based data and the use of social data to actually give tools to frontline staff such that they have uh, better negotiating power. Um, case in point uh, is, is is in class. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring in cap capital markets. Um, in capital markets, for uh, uh, which is pretty similar to uh, the data sets are pretty similar to uh, 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 would be in commercial insurance. What they are doing is combining quote to execution data. That's been always in silos, but technology and big data lake technology now has allowed cap uh, banks to sort of bring all of that data together. They're bringing all of that data together to first of all analyze how do institutional investors move, when do they move, who follows whom. Um, plus, along with that, um, the classic data from markets that they use, Reuters, Bloomberg, and others, are all coming in to first of all profile their clients better, to profile their own um, salespeople better, what kind of uh, a, a, a deal should go to whom and who is best place to convert it. But equally, they are looking at competitive market in terms of which institutional investor basically invest and which ones follow them, which hedge fund moves first and which ones follow them. All of that is all being brought together um, to do this analysis and give daily insights to their sales teams so that they can make, move, uh, they can make moves. On the commercial banking side, um, the, the 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 clients I have worked with have been the clients that I. I'm sorry, I think my voice is breaking. Um, Mark, can you hear me well? I'm going to try to be nearer keep, keep, to my. Keep going, Sulab. Just stay close to the screen like that. Yeah. 
Okay. So, um, so on the commercial banking side, um, what some of the major global banks have realized, uh, and I work with one of them, is that um, again, because of this distance and many more deals per sale staff that they have to handle or originators that they have to handle, um, a lot of the times, uh, their origin originators, people who originate loans and work with SMEs and 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 and, uh, and businesses, are actually leaving money on the table. So they want to basically close a deal really quickly because they've got like ten other uh, um, calls to attend to um, uh, when they have their meetings. Uh, and what's that basically? What, what that's basically doing is that they are they are not really getting all of the information uh, uh, and not using it enough to really figure out what the willingness to pay uh, for a certain loan is and 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 and, and not pricing dynamic. And there, um, again, um, data utilizing uh, uh, information on the client, information on their industry. Why are the client basically asking for a loan at this stage? What's, what's the reasoning behind just the basic relationship that you know, they've had with the bank? What's the, is, is it for more inventory management? Is there something happening upstream in the industry uh, that, that supplies to them? Those kind of things are all being brought together, again, to give tools so that uh, uh, originators can price uh, um, 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 loans properly and on the spot. And there is evidence to suggest that companies that are producing tools and utilizing market sentiment data have actually got a 6x uh, times uh, uh, chance of more profitability uh, than other companies. And these are, these, are, these, these are researchers that basically have been produced by many universities, including Harvard. And the key thing here is that this is not only happening in commercial lines. If you, um, I, did a, I did a very big project with a, a, a bank um, 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 in, the, in the last two years where it's also happening on the personal lines. How do you give financial guardian or negotiating tools which integrate all of this information to better manage your customers in the retail space Plus, also giving it to customers such that they can manage their own products better, products that they buy of banks or of, of insurers. Um, so um, that's that's my perspective on it. Uh, very, Mark, over back uh, over to you again. It, but, but John, I, we, you and I were chatting about this one before, and you had some great examples, even on both the retail side as, as well, on on where you've applied this and kind of how you've approached it. Yeah, I mean. I think, first of all, uh, we have an autonomous question that's come in um, as well. The key point about this is I don't see these type of transformations being big bang. So one of the key things that, you know, we know from the insurance industry, and it's a great question about this being an autonomous, you know, sorry, the autonomous question came in and saying that it, it grew up in the analog era. So everything was done in voice, everything was done on paper, etc. So I suppose the first thing we have to look at is when I work with customers, and I'll give you some examples of how this has worked, we have to understand the data you have today that is valuable to you as a business. E.g., we have to know for what you're famous for. Once we know the data we have, then we have to then add in the additional data that gives you better insight. We also know that we have to get the technology closer to the end user, so the barrier of adoption is low as possible. It's very easy to create a very complex, unused platform. It's very hard to create a platform that's easy to use and actually gives great insight when you need it. One of the great examples I like is, um, and this is in the retail space, which is uh, an Indian insurance company called Bazaar. And what they did was they realized actually a lot of their challenges were, was getting an interaction with their user at the edge. And in the same as where an underwriter would have to interact with a broker, the closer you can make the broker and the underwriter having an engagement, then you're more likely to get an earlier success from it. So what they do is they use conversational AI or what we call contact center AI. Now there's different models. Uh, we're all used to uh, what I call chat bots that are in websites that look like a human, but don't quite look like a human. What they actually found and a lot of companies find is actually it's when the human is given that digital assistant. So when you're actually in the conversation in an analog sense, when you can then take the data and give that assistant to the expert to be even better informed. Let me give you an example. I work with a company at the moment that does uh, very boutique uh, offerings. 
what they did is they used uh, a virtual contact assistant. And this is like understands the individual's uh, way they engage with the customers. They understand the behavior of that agent. And when people order up and have a delivery, one of the pieces the agent, this virtual agent will give is the weather of the day. Why is that important? Well, if it's a high value delivery, the last thing you want to do is find it getting wet. So they will determine to the agent and say, inform the customer it's going to be wet. And it means that then the customer is informed, they get a better service. What they typically find is if you have this human and technology, you typically get about 400% uplift in customer satisfaction. What I could see happening in this industry, like uh, Bazaar did, is actually getting the technology to the edge so you can still have a human conversation, but you're better informed. And using all these different data lenses that we've talked about, you know, I've talked about what happened with market money supermarket Tom, talked about what happened with Brit and Key, is everything is about changing that front engagement. What I feel that you're going to find is that we need to, there's three barriers of adoption. There's the first barrier, which is the cultural change. And I think both questions we've had today are about the cultural change. The second is about the technology religious debate we have. And then the third is the politics of the environment we work within. All three of these are headwinds. So what I urge you to do is think of your business, ascertain what is inefficient today, ascertain the data that's key to you as a business, and then use technology to accelerate either how you optimize your business or insight it gives you to be more competitive. And what we're trying to say here is actually the private data you have that is historical is equally as important as the data that you don't have today that may even be freely available. Join together, they give you a very different view that gives you the intelligence to have a more meaningful conversation. So if you're gonna start on this journey, and then I'll pass back to Mark, start with a very specific piece of work that will add the biggest impact to your business with the lowest bar of entry. Do not try to go big bang and certainly don't treat it as just a technology project. Treat it as people, process and technology. Those three elements are critical, like these three bubbles that we have here. So I'll pass back to Mark <coughs> to let us carry on. And in, in, in John, I'm, I'm gonna come back to you in a second because uh, I'd also love you to share some of your micro segmentation stories that we, we chatted before. But, but I wanna pick on one of the points that I, that I love that you called out that I think even goes beyond this concept is, Getting, close, getting the underwriter closer to the broker or to the end customer. One of the things that we did in the small business side, so going down towards more of the retail, right? At the end of the day, small business, you know, thinking about your, your mom and pop restaurants, those types of things as a high volume business. And we did research, um, we, we did some research out there around how's that end insurance decision made and who's making it? And typically it's the owner. Right? And so if you think of a restaurant, you now need, got, you as a broker need to go in and have that direct conversation with that owner. And that owner lives and breathes that business day in and day out. It is basically their baby. Right? And so what we did is we developed a tool to actually be able to give to the brokers as the insurance company that would allow you as a broker when you walked in to know tons of information about this business, to not just have that insurance conversation, but similar to John's example of like the weather one, you know, is you, you come in and say to the restaurant or pub, wow, I know you had a great brand, brand, sorry, great band in last night. And I hear there's great reviews. I see you have a new special. How's it doing? Come in at this time because I know you're not busy. Right? And, and it suddenly changed that conversation where that owner who needs to make the insurance decision goes, oh, wow. I really trust this broker. And so then when you move into the insurance transaction conversation, you've changed the game on, on how you've done that. But but John, would love if you go into some of the micro segmentation pieces that you've done in the past. I think that's relevant around understanding that end customer to then competitively position around them. Yeah, it, I actually bring out really, one of the things that I've noticed in conversations with customer through COVID-19, this specifically started in Italy. I hosted a round table with a number of uh, companies and one of them was an insurance a retail insurance company and this word appeared pretty much out of the blue is this micro segmentation but specifically behavior and what they they were saying is that they've seen with COVID-19 or the pandemic we have today that actually your engagement must be much more personalized 
And actually you understanding the behavior of not only in the case of an underwriter, the broker, but in the case of retail, the consumer is super important because the businesses that have, have had some of the best success have really understood their consumer to make that experience better than anybody else. So what I urge people to do is when you look at your data, it's, it's really super important to start considering the micro segmentation for two reasons. One, it's super in, easy with data to get a bias in your view. Um, and if you get a bias, you get an outcome that is may not be best for you, may not be best for your broker or your consumer. The other important point about it is if you start understanding the next level of micro segmentation, you start to understand the behavior and the characteristics of that person through data. And there's many researches, Google, we do this uh, in a lot of our customer conversations, is you start getting an insight you never had before to give you a different experience with them. Because experience is what people are looking for at the moment, the human side of that job. So I over cadence on the human element a lot in this, because it's easy for me as a technologist to over cadence on the technology. Um, and one of the things that we also need to be very aware of, and another question's come in from Andy, uh, and this is another really good question actually, which I'll answer now if it's okay. Do you believe smart technology will increase the residential properties and the importance of the insurers, the use of data uh, from the various devices to understand customer behaviors? So there's a super important element here. Uh, there's a word called privacy, which we have to uh, respect. It's super important. Also, it's understanding the why. It's why would this data be important to you? Is it because then you could lower the premiums because then they're more at home than you thought? So they're not going to be uh, uh, more worried about the threat of, uh, uh, you know, claims. It, you really have to explain the why to not only yourself, but to the consumer. And it has to be a value. So what I urge people to do is even with the introduction of smart technologies and IoT, we in the, we in the industry call it moving it to the edge. All of this is possible but make it crystal clear why you need it and what you're going to be famous for together. And don't make it just, I need the data. Uh, you know, you can overwhelm yourself with that. So hopefully it helps you, Andy, and back to you, Mark. Yeah, that, that's great, John. It, let's move on to our last of our, our kind of three areas that we think can be really changed with by leveraging all these types of technologies that we're talking about. It, and this is around the concept of saying, can you be dynamically and regularly optimizing your portfolio and your underwriting strategy? You know, Sulab was picking on some examples from, from some other industries, as was John. And, and again, we always try to look to some other area industries on, you know, inspiration. And if you think about a hedge fund or an asset manager, right? They don't sit there at the start of the year and go, okay, I'm going to go and invest this amount in bonds, this amount in stocks, and then I'll revisit it next January, right? That yes, they, they come up with a plan, but then they're constantly responding and adjusting that depending what happens in the market, where can they get the best return within their risk appetite, and where do they go and deploy their capital? So if you take a step back and you add in the two topics that we just talked about, right, you now have the future where the underwriter is being guided with these really unique insights to make the underwriting decision. So the underwriting decision is now, you know, I don't want to say it's easy, but they've got all the right information. So they're making the accurate decisions. They're making them tight. Then the next piece is that we're now guiding the underwriters through the competitive side. How do you respond to the customer? How do you position this with the broker? Well, the next piece then obviously is then going, well, now that you have that kind of even more powerful underwriter than you do today and more flexibility, because that underwriter isn't maybe bound to one class anymore. Now they, with those tools, it's going to be easier for them to underwrite different types of classes and different geographies. Again, there's you know, obviously licensing considerations that need to go on top of this. Well, wouldn't it be incredible then if you were then monitoring the market at all times, you know what rates are being accepted. You suddenly realize there's a, seg a segment of the market where you're able to get higher rates than you were expecting, right? So you're now monitoring that demand and you're seeing that there's a great opportunity. You're seeing that competitors aren't jumping on that opportunity. So were you able to then optimize that por portfolio by immediately adjusting it to potentially go, you know, that's the area we want to go into, right? We realize that agriculture in Asia, for some reason this week, we're able to get more rate than we anticipated. Let's pivot our portfolio to that. That might need to be offset and hedged with another set of risks that you might now need to go send a team out. Similarly, on the other side, can you go and adjust in real time your capital strategy 
of, okay, yes, originally I was thinking I was going to go just get this type of reinsurance contract and those other pieces, um, but can you pivot around and adjust that strategy in real time? And then the last piece as you're adjusting though is you can now re-pivot your workforce or your digital tools around different types um, of the market. So again, going back to that, you've got this powerful underwriter and you suddenly realize that agriculture in Asia is what's taking off. Can you go and pivot in real time your, your, your workforce? And so we think this is a really, really, really powerful concept, but it is a major cultural change as well as you know, risk, compliance, et cetera, that needs to go into it. It's saying take that yearly process and can you now condense it and be doing it on a continuous basis in the market to constantly be optimizing how you're, you're doing that. Um, John, do you want to kind of quickly talk about some of your thoughts on this and we'll, then we'll get right into some of those questions because I know we're, we're running on time. Yeah, and actually I think what's really important here is actually Alberto and Dominic, you asked two great questions on this. First of all, we're in a time at the moment where our insight of our historical past may not be relevant to the future we're tracking because we're in unprecedented uh, uh, times where actually we might not have the same insight and it's changing so us getting weekly reports or monthly reports at the moment everything can change within a week so for me the velocity of understanding that data is super important and one of the things that um, both questions relate to is actually I've talked about it three times now actually empowering the end user and what we find is that the way that you will best innovate is by in, is allowing your own people to actually express their views of where the challenges are. Is having experts like Deloitte and Google come in, we can give you insight to the journey and the other situations we've been in across multiple customers. But what's the most powerful is where you take your most insightful people, allow them to express what they're seeing on the ground to then allow you to then adapt it quickly. I, I always say that even in experiments, even if you think it failed, you learn something. No experiment learns nothing. And I say that as part of this is you've got to up the cadence of intelligence around data. You have to use it and you have to move to understanding the quality of the data. So one of the things that Google's very proud of is how we've invested in a lot of the technology to understand the data. So let me give you an example. We've talked about machine learning, but everybody is saying, does machine learning actually give me an outcome that I can trust? And one of the things that Google, and you can look at this on the web, is we have explainable AI that allows you to understand your models to make sure that it isn't biased. All of these techniques you're gonna to have to use, but it's a combination of both technology, people, and process. So working as a team is super critical. So hopefully that gives you an insight. I know we've got two additional questions, but I'll pass back to you, Mark. No, that, that, that's, that's great, John. Um, hey, just before we move off this topic, you know, I, I wanted to bring into the conversation another colleague of mine, Jack Wally. Jack, Jack uh, originally was in industry and joined us at Deloitte, and his job is basically making these transformations real and looking at some of the questions. I think there's going to be a lot of questions specifically about how do you make some of this real and executable. Jack, before we jump into the questions, is there anything you want to add? Because I know when you were in industry, you were living this as a yearly type cycle versus it being that dynamic, agile cycle that we're excited about. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, for me, it's, it's about somewhat about breaking the business planning and strategy cycle down. I know that's going to min scare many of your financial directors and your CFOs out there, but it doesn't need to be an onerous annual process. And for many Lloyds players on the call, I appreciate you've got uh, constraints set by the market. But effective organizations really need to identify and be prepared to continue to continually assess their portfolio, uh, be that the business, business objectives, their KPIs, their priorities based on real-time experience and feedback. That insight might mean that strategies and plans are simply adjusted or altered, and that shouldn't be seen as a sin. It should be endorsed, and it's all about trading smart in my eyes, reacting to your competitors' moves, being able to adjust them and reassess the market, um, or equally adjust your reinsurance posture. I think Alberto, you make a really good point around the lead and follow basis. And I think there's a lot to be learned in, in the lead and follow markets. In fact, you're, you're in a unique position in, in, that, in those markets because there's so much insight to be learned from your competitors' strategy, strategies that allows you to sort of uh, capitalize on those and be able to adapt your strategies to make sure that you can uh, play into the white space and identify where, where, where growth potential is. But also it gives you an opportunity to balance your portfolio accordingly. 
Uh, a portfolio-driven approach will have some winners and losers, though. Uh, and you may pick up some new business through a portfolio-driven approach in the in the lead and follow market, but equally, it may mean, mean that you walk away from some parts of your, your business today. Um, I think some ex examples, Mark, you talked about um, are really great, but I think it's also important to look at this piece with a workforce agenda as well. It's also about the workforce and operations, shaping your workforce to embrace change. Many will be used to being in an annual cycle, uh, and it's, it's about building a positive culture uh, of change and having variability and making sure that the, uh, the workforce is able to adapt and respond to that accordingly and not feel afraid by that change. That, that, that's awesome, Jack. Well, what I'm going to quickly do here, if, if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to pivot into our, um, our questions and answers. There's lots of great questions coming in, and we've only got about, about five or six minutes left. Hey, hey John, I, I would love if we can call on you. There were sort of um, two, two questions here that I thought potentially you, you would have some insight on. Um, you know, we've hit on a lot of different points in here. Do you think some of these are relevant for the UK motor market, specifically in context of aggregators? And you were hitting on some of your work that you've done in this space. You want to share your thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, I'll give you a real life example. I'm working with uh, an insurance company at the moment and where we're using PSI data. So this is public sector information, specifically MOT data. Why would we use MOT? First of all, it's available. It's available every year. It's pretty much up to date of the passes and failures that occur. And why is this super important? Well, first of all, you don't get um, go. You go down to regional level, so you can go to Birmingham, London, uh, you know, Surrey, etc. What's super useful is I start seeing which cars regularly fail MOTs. Why they fail MOTs? We look at, and you see like in certain areas, certain cars fail a lot for like tire wear which means that probably the car's not well maintained, that may impact your premiums. So through that insight, you can now start predicting which cars are likely to fail, which ones will pass, what will fail, what will pass. And you can start understanding the demographics much more. And it gives you better insight that you never had before. The really important bit about this, all this data is freely available under the government's uh, data.gov.uk website. Um, and I'm starting to see now that a lot of people are realizing they can get insight from it to guide their customers as well on maintenance they should be doing to their cars. So example, if we know certain cars have, uh, wear out more brake wear, that actually it's, it's more easier for you to explain to your customers what they can do. And a lot of insurance companies now have service elements to their insurance company. So this may be an upsell for you. If you then proactively told your service side, we should be actually proactively going to these car owners because they are going to have more highlight a change on brake wear. So that gives you a cross sell. This is the type of things that we're already seeing. Um, back to the other question that John raised. Um, the challenge with the world today is the world is very different. So some are highly digitized economies, some are highly manualized economies, and you can't really treat each one exactly the same. What we do know is you've also got to look at your buyer type. So the underwriter works with brokers, but the brokers work with customers. Certain end customers that brokers work with will have a very different lens, like the mum and pup business you talked about, Mark. There's a very different lens to someone like a Google. And you know we have to respect that. So getting insight of what the broker has to deal with gives you better insight on what you can do to help the broker. So for me, you know, I always look at Asia because I find that their, their technology um, uh, uh, adoption is very aggressive. I also look at Europe because of the way it's very mature, but intrinsically there's a, there's a better source of data. Um, life is having a lot of uh, interesting use of technology and commercial, as I said, are now using technology at the edge, like scanning documents and imaging. So there's many different examples which we can share with you. So back to you, Mark. I think that's completely aligned with your observations there, John. And again, we we'll probably have a whole webinar on itself on some of those topics there. Um, I'm just going to try to pick on two last questions. I apologize we're not going to get to all of them, but please follow up with us. We'd be happy to have further conversations. Um, Sue Lab, there's been some questions and chatter in, in the Q&A around, you know, how can you change or, you know, how does the customer interaction itself change? with some of these additional data sources and or AI and machine learning. I was wondering if you either had a good example or could just reference kind of that, that question. Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, with, with, with newer data sources, the, the consumer interaction changes in the first instance from being, um, from actually from asking the customer questions to actually working with the customer and, 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 and um, having a two-way conversation. Um, practical examples from personal lines is, um, 
um, instead of instead of asking the customer, like in motor insurance, um, the example that John was talking about, in motor insurance, um, you could use uh, so many different sources, and we have used many different source, uh, different data sources to actually calculate uh, just based on where people live, uh, based on their postcodes, what are the kind of blind spots around this where accidents can happen. So there are lots of different things you can do with the uh, with the uh, with the data that uh, 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 different global license agencies also have in motoring example another case that John bought where you don't really need to ask 48 questions to the to the customer before before you give them a quote so there is there is that first bit which is just less questions let less one way conversation and more of a two way conversation that's number one number two um, the use of um, I think John brought up a really good point, and I want to sort of like talk about it a bit more. The use of digital assistance, the use of chatbots, they are they are a classic example of how insurers and other financial services and in industry are interacting with the customer, answering some of their questions, but if you look a bit more deeper, also collecting information on the customer, which has been a very different kind of uh, level of uh, uh, emotional intelligence. And, and, and we basically think that in the next five or six years, emotional intelligence data, haptic feedback from such devices is going to form the core of behavioral micro segmentation. Um, so, so just in summary, it's two ways. Uh, number one is it gives you basically like, you know, it stops you asking more questions, gets you into, uh, get, gets, gets the interaction into two-way conversation. And third is it's a very different way of collecting uh, emotional intelligence um, um, and, and other other such data. Um, that's that's how I see basically interaction change. That, that's that's great, Sula. It's great. Um, look, last question, and then I, I know everyone's got to uh, got to drop off. Jack, I, I wonder if you could just talk about. There, there's been some questions asked around. You know, okay, great. If you have all of this, then what's the role of the broker? You know, does their role fundamentally change if you have all these insights that they don't? Where do they end up playing in there? Can, can you share your your thoughts on that? Yeah, great, sure, Mark. Uh, and I think also another part of that question is around, so do we see brokers being sort of more risk management than transaction? Um, personally, to me, I think brokers should already be geared towards risk management. I think an effective broker will see that the market's shifting and they'll work on delivering value to the customers above and beyond what they do today in the risk management space, uh, particularly as insurers become more armed with data and insight that typically they've relied on the brokers to provide to them. And I think intrinsically that's going to challenge the commission play of many of the brokers because uh, they're not they're not going to be able to drive and command the market as well as uh, with insurers having all this data and insight at their fingertips. Um, they typically relied on brokers to provide. But I think ultimately the brokers, I'm working with the start market and uh, quite a few other members of the team around sort of what's the broker of the future. And we're seeing similar trends there. I think in a successful broker, we one that sort of uh, identifies that they already sit on a wealth of data and they can make better judgments in the market around where their target markets are and what the sentiment of the, uh, the underlying markets are and how they uh, make, make better placement decisions. But I think crucially from an insurer's perspective, if all of a sudden the data uh, and the decision making and the insight is more in the hands of a uh, insurer, um, it's going to really challenge a lot of the commission uh, plays on, on the brokerage side. Yeah, that's awesome, Jack. I, and again, that's probably a webinar in itself, the future of the broker, and um, maybe maybe we'll get that one in the books. Um, we're going to call it there because it is 12 o'clock, and I originally wanted to kind of end a little bit, a little bit earlier for everyone. Really, really appreciate everyone joining today. We would love to have follow-up conversations. These are great, exciting times in insurance. Please reach out to any of us. We'd be happy to have those chats and set them up and go deeper on any of these topics or get on some of the other topics like the future of the broker um, uh, if, if, if you'd like. Thank you very, very much and uh, look forward to speaking to many of you. Thanks.